Um, yeah, hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Learning Curves podcast. Uh, we're here to take you down the winding road that is learning how to make art. Uh, we're coming from the perspective of people who you know are still in the middle of the journey. Uh, so if you're at the beginning, we can hopefully help you avoid some of the mistakes that we made when we first set off. And if you're a bit further down the road, then hopefully you can learn some new things along with us, with the people that we interview. Maybe you can even help out some people who are listening in uh, with some of your own sage advice and wisdom. And yeah, at the very least, I hope you all get a little bit of entertainment out of uh, watching us struggle to hold this podcast together with duct tape. So yeah, I guess we should talk a little bit about who we are. My name is David. I'm a concept artist working for a game studio. Lately, I'm doing some character art job and some prop designs. Besides my work, I'm organizing an art festival in Slovakia, Košice, and it's called Game Days. My name's Adam. I'm a prop artist and illustrator, currently working on an indie game uh, and an illustrated book. And yeah, when I'm not drawing, I'm looking after plants and a whole bunch of cats. So uh, yeah, where did the idea for this come from, then, David? So yeah, I met Adam one year ago in Poland, Dansk. We are studying together at Focal Point, and we quickly realized that we did the same mistakes in our, our journeys. And when we had like learned from the same resources, we somehow came away with very different perspectives and learned a lot from each other just by talking about them. That inspires to get groups of people together to talk about their like own art experiences. And hopefully with this podcast, we will give people tools to achieve their goals quicker. Yeah, with that, I hope everyone's comfortable and let's get started with the first interview. Hi everyone. So yeah, this week got the absolute pleasure of being joined by uh, Kenny Vo and Alex Honeycutt. Um, so yeah, just starting off, I guess it'd be great to uh, have you guys just introduce yourself, maybe tell us where we can take a look at your work if anyone isn't familiar with it. Um, and I guess mainly just outline kind of the journey that you took to get where you are now. Um, yeah, if wants to jump in, go for it. Uh, Alex, you got seniority, he can go first. Uh, pulling Sweet. rank. <laughs> hi, yeah. So, hi. My name is Kenny Vo. Um, I'm a uh, currently a visual development artist at Paramount Animation for uh, Transformers. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I've been working since about 2016. My my first studio job was at uh, School Pad Studios, that I started off as a junior and then worked my way up to uh, to lead to lead concept artist, and then from there uh, went over to Machine Zone, worked on some mobile games over there. Mostly uh, on my side was uh, the blue sky ideation because that's kind of where I, uh, I guess I, I tend to kind of float towards. And then from there, went up to Sony with some more uh, blue sky ideation. And then from there, went to Netflix animation for, for about two years. And then uh, here I am now at uh, the Paramount. Um, so as far, as far as my professional career goes, um, mm-hmm. I... Started school at uh, well, I started school in, at University of Houston, but uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a double dropout, so I dropped out of there. And then, you know, not for grade reasons or anything, just because I wanted to kind of pursue art more. And I went to Noman School of Visual Effects before it became accredited, and then uh, eventually left there as well, and ended up at uh, a school called uh, Brainstorm. And then from there. I've been taking classes or I was taking classes from about 2015 to about 2018. Um, and then uh, now currently I'm the, uh, the world building two for animation teacher, the ENT one and the, uh, the world building flash teacher for a, uh, for a brainstorm. So, yeah. Nice. So third time was the charm. <laughs> Clearly, <then. laughs> um, yeah. What about you, Alex? What's kind of your, your path to where you are now? That was very succinct of like the last 10 years for Kenny. I don't know if I can be that quick. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I, I'm just too wordy. I'm sorry. As <laughs> I started off uh, through high school as a musician, I was um, all state and international placing jazz trombonist. And I thought I was going to be either a jazz performer or music educator. But when I went into college, I had to pivot and switch to, I first tried out engineering and then computer science because my parents were saying, like, you won't get any financial support if you don't Mm -hmm. go for a STEM degree. So uh, kill your dreams, get a job, that sort of thing. (laughs) And uh, so I I powered through uh, for I finished early, three and a half years, and then I got my first job 
at a medical tech company in Kansas City. And my first six months, I immediately realized this, like, wow, I do not want to do this for the next 50 years. I was just sitting, typing buttons, doing stuff that I didn't like to do to begin with. So I started looking around and just feeling like, what could I do that wouldn't require a whole college degree again? Or if I needed to, what would I actually want? I thought it'd be architecture. Uh, I did UX, UI design boot camps for a little bit, but then Into the Spider-Verse, the movie came out December, 2018, and just boom, just changed everything, just blew my mind. And I realized that I wanted to do whatever it was that that was. And so I immediately started seeking out answers, solutions for like, how do you work professionally as an artist? Um, and so I started really just bunkering down for it, you know? So like I, I was already through college, I was already professionally working. I knew it's like, I, I've got a fiance. I don't really have time to dilly dally. If I need to get this done, I need to really plan this out and go efficiently. So I, I put together a little curriculum thing for myself and started teaching myself um, at about a year and a half. I got a recommendation from Jeffrey Talbot. He was a ex brainstorm student and he recommended that I go to brainstorm to start working on design and, and targeting career skills. So here we are, we're um, three and a half years, three, three years and like seven months of me learning art. Um, and I've now gotten a background painting job on an indie animated show by Chalk Chip animations, who they're called. And I work full time at Alta VR. They're an Australian based virtual reality game studio. And very happy to say so. I uh, met Kenny along the way, and as well as Kaysen and several other great brainstorm teachers. So it's been really cool so far. Yeah, that's awesome. It's so good to hear as well that, you know, you've started finding work and you got a full-time placement. So congrats. Thank <laughs> on you. That. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, you'll probably like delve into that a little bit later on, especially that transition, uh, you know, from studying to work. And it's great that you managed to do that so quickly as well. Like I feel like three and a half years is a pretty, pretty speedy pace <laughs> to be setting yourself for. So um, I thought so yeah. for a bit, and then I met Chris Farley. I don't know if you've seen him around in, in Kenny's Oh, no. That oh. something else. The new speedster has arrived. A year and a half, and he's <laughs> producing just professional-looking stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess a, a follow-up question on that before we go more into, you know, specific teacher or student questions would just kind of be checking in with both of you on where you actually place yourself on that scale. How much of a student do you feel like you still are? How much of a professional you are or a teacher? Like kind of where do you put the weighting on uh, how you view yourself between those areas? Yeah. Um, when the, the role of student to teacher, I guess in terms of where I'm at now, right? Like it changes because <clears throat> there's times where like, especially in the beginning when you're learning, right? We, we, we think that the, the student dynamic is like always learning like your fundamentals, getting better at painting, photo bashing, learning the next technology, whatever it is, right? Um, but I have found that to be, I guess, a less and less occurrence for me, right? Because, you know, as mm -hmm. you're getting better, obviously you're not working on perspective as much. But the, I guess the, the tendency to be learning things has been almost increasing. Because it's kind of like, um, you know, like they were saying, the, the better you get at something, the, the less you know, right? The more you realize that you don't know. And it shifts from being about drawing, painting, design fundamentals, and starts going into how to be a better lead, how to be a production designer, how to be an art director, right? What does it mean to talk to a director? What does it mean to talk to a modeler, VFX artist, whoever? And, you know, constantly learning those next few skills, um, they t it takes, obviously it's a little like less intensive than learning, like doing a hundred paintings a week or whatever it is, like, like a normal student would do. But that, that constant drive for uh, just learning what the next steps are, uh, I think for me has been getting even like even increasing as we go. So, I mean, in terms of, uh, I guess, 
learning the fundamental art things. I do, I do try to pick up things here and there. Uh, I try to learn new programs when they happen. And, you know, I'm always at least like, let, let's say like out of my, out of my time, 30% of it is trying to learn something new fundamental wise. Um, but the rest of the time really comes down to just trying to pay attention more in meetings, being, uh, kind of being part of meetings that I'm actually not, uh, not really a part of just because, um, they, they never go, Hey, you're almost an art director. Let's, let's go teach you how to be an art director. No, they just say, Hey, you're ready. Uh, we have a spot. Can you take it? Right. And you just have to hope that you were paying attention with your art directors, you know? So, um, long story short, um, I'm always in that student mode. Uh, there's always something to learn. There's always something to, uh, to kind of grab. So, I would say like what, it's like one to 10, you know, maybe like 70% still a student, you know, uh, but there is a level of professionalism that, you know, I have to have to hold just because, you know, I am an educator, a brainstorm. I am a, uh, a an artist at a studio and sometimes a more senior artist at, at the studios that I've been to. So, Yeah, awesome. I, I think that's what sets the best apart is that always student mindset. If, if you think that you've made it, then you're already falling behind, at least how I'd view it. You know, like I, I'm by no means the, the best at what I do. I still consider myself very junior. Um, so I fully student. If I get somebody to pay me uh, to keep me afloat while I'm still trying to teach myself, <laughs> that'd be great. But it, there's like, I've got a whole checklist of things that I want to keep doing further down the line of like brand new stuff that I haven't touched yet. And I'm only scratching the surface. Like I was looking through the stuff you've done, Adam, and you've got some modeling skills. It's like, well, that's the next thing that I really want to touch on. And then hmm. like uh, touching action storyboarding. And then what happens if you, you know, maybe you, you do go down the viz dev route, but uh, overall, I want to be a self-publisher. Like I want to make my own concept books and and teach people. So you, there's all these sorts of things that I want to go down, and just that constant curiosity or just like, what's the next thing down the path? Because I find it's super easy to to be like, oh, I finally got that thing I was working towards, and it's not even a what's next. It's like I've already forgotten about it, and I'm thinking about mm -hmm. the next. One. I, I never just sit down and say, oh, great. I'm super happy that I accomplished my goal. It's just that <laughs> the goals just naturally shifted halfway along the way. And I didn't even realize that I accomplished them. And then you're, you're still just looking for, for more answers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying that fits in with what Kenny was saying <laughs> a lot, I guess, with that uh, shifting of goals. I don't think anyone, you know, bakes themselves a, I am a junior artist cake. He leaves it in the fridge, like, <laughs> ready, ready for the day um, <laughs> that it comes around. Um, it was interesting, though, that you said you view yourself fully as a student because, um, I mean, obviously, as you're saying, you've got started the junior role and you feel like, you know, you've got a long way to go and there's lots of things you want to learn. But um, something that's really interesting, I'd say, about you in particular is uh, for anyone who isn't familiar, Alex put together um, a site and PDF, an idea called the curriculum, and it was kind of a focused study guide or a way of kind of navigating art resources on the internet um yeah we'll put a link to that for people to check out if they are unfamiliar with it um it's useful but i'd say like even when you were starting out studying i don't know if you viewed yourself that way but you know there is some kind of tutor mentoring role or at least uh kind of helping people who might be where you are in your journey or maybe just one step behind you going on there so is that something that um you know maybe you'd consider doing more of in the future or um is something that you consider important like do you view that as part of learning or is that a separate thing that you want to expand on you know when you're further on down the line yes absolutely and i that's a really cool thing that you said is do i view it as a part of learning is mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I, I didn't put two and two together on that but i, I think it's my my wife kind of teases me for it but the moment i learn something new i turn around and i tell somebody about it that's i i regurgitate what i learned and i explain it to them in a way that i would think is approachable for them uh, it's just something i've always done and going looking back and helping other people i think that that's a really key 
strategy for success. As I'm sure you've probably heard before and many others, like one of the best ways to know, to learn what you don't know is to try and teach someone else. But if you can consolidate it down and really distill that, uh, it, it's the most effective way for you to learn yourself. But in terms of like plans to teach others, I would absolutely enjoy doing that. I, when I first met Kenny, he asked, uh, he always asks in his classes, like, what do you want to do? down the line is like, I just want to teach, man. <laughs> it, it's really, I, I like to do what I do and then I like to share it with other people. So that would be a goal going forward. Yeah. Just, just like adding on to that real quick, like, you know, just because, um, you know, like you're not, you're not a teacher because, uh, someone gave you a job to teach students or whatever it is, right. <laughs> it, it's, it, it has nothing to do with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting paid for it. Right. But that doesn't mean that, um, you know, you're, you are, you're not a teacher, right? It's really like just the help the, to, to give other people maybe something that they are missing that little piece, just that little bit, because, um, you know, it starts off when you're students where, um, there's a, there's a range of levels in the class and maybe you're not even the best, um, but you picked up on something and then somebody else was struggling with that. And, you know, that's, that's really all it is. Um, because, you know, in classes, if you learn something and you pass it to somebody else, next time they learn something, they'll pass it to you. And it does. So there's that, that there's that camaraderie that happens that, you know, a lot of, a lot of people that are similar in that aspect really are the ones that kind of become the teachers because the ones that hoard information, the ones that um, kind of keep things to themselves to get that, uh, I guess that advantage, you know, the, the, the perceived advantage, you know, chances are it's uh, the, uh, not a lot of people will really be asking for, for that person to teach. It's, it's the people that have just been doing it. And the most effective ones are the ones that have been doing it for a long time. And uh, I know for me, when I got, I got, I got first offered my, um, my teaching position for World Building 2 at Brainstorm, um, I was talking to James about it. And I was like, you know, I was like, why me, right? There's, there's, better, there's better teachers out there, you know, or even he could have took over the class and, you know, cause that's his class and he would have done it way better than, uh, than I could have. Right. But then he, you know, we were talking about it and he was like, you know, really it's, you have a, you have a perspective that, uh, other people don't have, right. Not even just the way I perceive things, but a closer relationship to what the industry is like now, right. For, for a student, because, you know, I have, I have entered the industry later than he has right? Because he entered it, you know, 15, 20 years ago or whatever. And it's different now than it was then. And I guess that dynamic is really interesting because you get people that um, are able to, I guess, understand the issues just a little bit closer. So, you know, people of all levels, regardless of where you're at, if you have a job or not, if you can help somebody that is just a little bit, maybe a, one step behind you, not even because you're better or they're worse, but just because you maybe started maybe six months earlier or whatever and constantly like doing that with each other, you know, the, the group gets better together because I can only pick up so many things, but when somebody else, you know, picks up something, it, it, you kind of like throw it into the pot and we all, you know, just start growing and, and, and create this whole culture of helping each other out. And that's how, you know, you get to be, you have a successful group of friends, not just by yourself, you know? Yeah, that's super useful to know. Um, and it kind of is something we touched on actually in the last conversation that we've had. And it's something I've been discussing with my friends, kind of just how much it feels like your growth can kind of be accelerated by meeting a small group of people or a large group of people that essentially when you go from being that solitary lone unit, trying to find as many answers you can for yourself and try to decide which ideas are worth retaining and which ones aren't to meeting some other people who have also had that process um the, the the progress you make tends to just accelerate up exponentially from uh that point so i guess it'd be interesting as i assume both of you you know have a community of people who you, you talk to maybe it'd be interesting to know how you found them for people who might be you know currently still on their own or feel like they're on their own trying to figure this out um like how did you guys kind of find your your tribe or how would you go about, you know, introducing yourself to some new people if you needed to do it again? Yeah. Early on for me, it was, I was 
I remember scouring Reddit. That was always a, a hot place for me to go to, to find discourse that's just a little bit deeper than, you know, Facebook, Instagram. <laughs> I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it's great, but usually if you find those more niche interest groups that people semi know what they're talking about, and you might be able to get a handle on it. And you kind of, you dig just deep enough where you go to a YouTube channel and there's a Discord link. And then that's your first entrance. And then you have to put yourself out there a little bit, you know, make yourself a little active, reply to everybody. And it's kind of like fishing, you know, you're, you're kind of throwing out bait on like, you, I want to interact in this manner in a manner that's a little bit deeper than just saying cool thing, man, thumbs up, thumbs up, heart, fire emoji. And uh, you might not always get a response, but maybe someone will respond to you on your level that you're interested in and you either keep that up and you kind of foster and build up that kind of culture within that community or i have done multiple times is just go and build a smaller one with the people that i've found who care and then it's a core group of 15 20 people who i have like every year there's a different stage where i've had a different group that has really pushed each other and then it kind of fizzles out and you naturally move on to another one. Um, then I'm sure Kenny could also share, but he has his own uh, private discord of past students. And that one has been really useful. Um, I'll start off with my first group. So, you know, I have, I have a group of friends that I went to school with. Um, you know, we all, we all did, right? You just, there's a class, there's people in there. And there's people that you kind of mesh with a little bit more. There's people that are roughly like the kind of same level that you are. And you're just helping each other out. And it starts off with like, you know, maybe you're overstepping. Maybe you're, you feel like you're kind of, you're like, should I say this? I don't know. You know, just because um, telling, giving crit, especially when it's unprompted, can be a very uh, uh, perceived aggression. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it always feels like you yeah. Your chair's just about to fall over. It gives me that same yeah. stomach lurch when I send someone crit for the first time. <laughs> yeah, and it's because you don't know how they're going to take it. But some people mm -hmm. take it really well. And then all of a sudden you get a crit from them and then back and forth and you have this camaraderie. You know, you're, you're probably roughly the same level if you're taking the same class. And then you're just kind of doing that for years. And for me, you know, I have the group of friends that I started, uh, you know, even Nomen or even Brainstorm with that... Anytime I need a paint over, anytime I need a set of eyes, um, I can send it to them. They'll give me a whole like Excel sheet or PDF, just like here, here's how you fix this. Um, you know, obviously it's less about painting now and more about how do we navigate the professional world, right? How do we increase our rates? What, what rate are you making? Right. And then that way, when I go apply somewhere, I should be, Oh, I'm charging not enough here. And it feels awkward at first, um, that first time you meet, but you know, 10, you know, 10 years later, everybody is a high-end professional and can contribute something really, really valuable. And that's where, that's what you're trying to build, right? Um, so that's like a, kind of my personal group. You and have then, you know, I teach classes wild, at... I'm sorry, just I, in your first early group, didn't you have some absolutely wild classmates like oh, yeah. Kevin Jick and Finian and all that? Yeah, so we had uh, Kevin wasn't in uh, wasn't in the first group with us. He he joined like maybe a couple terms later. I forgot exactly what class that was, but uh, you know we had Finn in in uh, in our first brainstorm class. You know, and and obviously there's a um, there's a level of student that you know you're you're not. It's hard to be part of that friend group just because they're outclassing you because he was like entry professional level at the time, and I was like beginner student. So. You know, I kind of did flock towards the more people mind level for sure. But, you know, I actually had uh, had had dinner with them the other day, you know, and it's, it's things like that where it's these these connections where you can just ask because, you know, now he's a creative director at a studio and, you know, you can ask him these things. You can talk to him and if you know, you know each other, it's a little less awkward than just like emailing a creative director being like, hey, so how much did you charge this client, you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> it gets a little bit personal, but it's the, it's these relationships that you build in class. Right. And that's what I'm trying to foster in my discord group that you had mentioned. So, you know, I have, uh, for those that don't know, I have a, I have a discord group with all my private students or all my students. 
uh, privately and we just help each other out, right? It's just, um, you know, creating that dynamic because maybe about a year, year and a half ago, there was no, no other professional in there. It was just me, right? And then there was whatever students were in there. But now, right, you have at least 10 to 15 professional artists, right? Just starting for sure. Uh, but, you know, that's, that number's only going to grow as the years go on. And then we have, you know, different connections at other studios that actually want to help you just because we are part of the same group. We grew together. We helped each other out, right? But it's, it's like... Um, I make a, for those that don't know, I make a huge deal out of like, turn on your camera, be part of the class because you can absolutely turn off your camera and just listen to the lecture or whatever, just do the homework. That's fine. But it's that connection building that's actually the most important because when someone else gets better, when someone else gets a job, that's going to help you get a job, right? Because now you know someone that can help you get a job at a place or even just has the professional experience to show you what you're doing wrong. And that stuff is so valuable because there's this idea that you, you get a job or you get a career just because you're out of your own fortitude, right? Out of your own skill. But uh, that's really not the case just because there's so many people that, that kind of enter that equation, whether, the, whether, whether it's friends helping out, teachers that just kind of helped out just a little bit more than they probably needed to. And uh, it really like, it brings everyone up. If one person gets better that in that community, the whole community gets better. And that's really what we're trying to build, you know? Yeah, I feel like I'm gonna have to put a disclaimer at the start of all of these that uh, we're not feeding <laughs> scripts to teachers. <laughs> Cause uh, it's a point that keeps like coming up again and again about engagement predominantly in classes. And, you know, if you wanna really make the most out of being in a classroom, it's not just turning up and doing your assignments it sounds like even teachers who are the ones setting the assignments are saying that's a part of it but really the most important part is you know meeting these people uh forming some kind of relationship with them and just sharing information around like a at least the teachers we've spoken to so far definitely seem to say like the information that we give you as part of the class is fractionally part of the value of what you're actually going to get from from being here so uh yeah i guess that's something or anyone who's uh about to become a student is uh even if it's a little nerve-wracking it sounds like it's very much worth it to take the plunge and you know engage <laughs> with the people in your class as much as possible if teachers are all saying that then <laughs> it's just because like it's so immediately ob obvious from the other end watching your students come in and they interact with you and you watch clearly watch them grow because they're engaged and then you see the other ones either fall to the wayside or even just not end up showing up because they were never engaged to begin with but even beyond that like you see the connections that engaged students make and they begin helping each other and that network builds and that it's like, like cluster roots that grow stronger together like what kenny was just saying mm -hmm. it's, it's just when you see it from the overarching view of the teacher you, you get this hypothesis of 20 students every every three months and then you watch what happens over the next half year year mm -hmm. and it's just like they have a very clear sight of that happening so yeah, yeah. i've you know i've taught um probably like 10 to 12 classes at this point you know obviously not that much but a good amount of students there right is 20 students per thing you know times 10 you know 200 250 students and seeing the difference between a class that participates versus a class that doesn't it's it's hard to describe how big of a gap that really is because even if even if the quiet class is just full of all stars and then the uh the the, the active class is full of uh you know kind of mid-level students or whatever the growth potential is huge um, and, you know, like you were saying, like seeing it from the outside, because, you know, I'm literally just watching these students grow and um, not only just participating in, you know, for example, Brainstorm does discords, but whatever other, um, you know, platforms that these other schools use, because you see, like, I'll give a crit to somebody, you know, it could be like, so let's say I'll give a crit to Alex. And then all of a sudden, uh, the next week, I'll see Adam use that same crit. Like, you'll see the same, like, I didn't tell him anything, but just because he saw it and their friends or they talked about it or whatever, 
there's a there's I guess the the crit kind of bounces around a couple more times. But I, you know, we've also had students that just kind of show up and just kind of solo it, where you know they don't talk to anybody, they just do the work, and they're and that's great. That's really all that's expected. But if you want to maximize your value, right, build some lasting connections. Um, this is how you do it because, you know, getting a job is is one of the hardest things you can do. Like just landing your first job is extremely difficult. And if you can do anything to make that easier, literally just by turning on a camera and just talking and sharing information, um, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna speed up your growth potential by years. You know, it could save you thousands of dollars and not even, and then even get you to your dream job, you know, maybe a decade sooner. So uh, an awkward segue on from that, I suppose. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, so obviously we're just talking about uh, building communities around classrooms and that being a uh, a big part, essentially, like you're not just there to learn fundamentals, but you're there to get these relationships and connections. And, you know, as you were saying, there's no uh, art director class at any school. But if you know someone who's an art director in five years time, that's information that you're going to be able to get. Also, just talking about growth from when you're a, a student, it'd be really interesting to hear from both of you if there was a period um, when you really felt uh, like your skills developed the most. And I'm curious if that was, um, you know, during school period when you're hunting for a job, maybe the first few months of being on a job, or maybe it's when you're a bit more comfortable and you can do a lot more personal work. Like, is there a period where you feel like you personally kind of experienced the most growth uh, whilst you've been studying so yeah man you know it's there's a couple of those right so for example uh, when i was a student um the first probably like year and a half there was i felt like i was getting worse to be completely honest uh, just because um you have so many fundamentals holding you back right because you learn perspective but then it looks like very not great it looks like those perspective drawings from you know, very <laughs> beginner level students and you start losing that organicness that you initially had when you didn't know perspective, right? There's a, there's a liveliness to your lines. There's a, there's a character to the way you draw, right? But now this fundamental thing happens. Same thing with anatomy, same thing with color theory. Uh, you get really robotic with it because you're following a formula in your head. <clears throat> so I felt like I was getting worse for a long time. And then, you know, there was a point to where I finally took this one class um, and it was digital painting in, 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 at Noman where it just kind of like clicked. Whatever the teacher was saying, everything kind of like just stitched together really nicely. And all my skills worked finally at some point started working together, right? That was like the kind of first time. And then that was when like, I guess my fundamentals were like, okay, I can, now I can paint things. I know, I kind of know what I'm doing. And then it was maybe about, about a year later, I took a, uh, a character design mentorship with Steven Silver and, you know, as me, I'm definitely more of an environment artist, but like the way he explained design for me finally clicked as to like what things were. Um, he explained things in terms of a character, but it applied to everything. So it was weird because my design fundamentals like just skyrocketed for whatever, obviously still a student, but just way better than what it was because my understanding of the whole topic finally clicked in. And I have these waves of like i have a bunch of information it's like having a bunch of like mechanical pieces but you didn't know you don't have the instruction booklet yet you know what i mean you're just like looking at a like a like an ikea kit and you're like what the hell is this and then you get the instructions and you have a shelf all of a sudden right um it was the same thing with my art skills where i was learning these skills and i didn't know how to apply it and so those the biggest jumps were coincidentally whatever class i was taking it could have been what they said or it could have just been the time it, i had in between learning things but things finally mesh together and there's this huge like just big jumps um but i would say the biggest jump was actually when i started working as a professional just because um once you know how to draw and paint once you know how to design that's actually still not enough because understanding what we do as concept artists is actually um, a, a really big, important step, mainly because in art school, we're always taught, um, I guess we're taught a little bit more in terms of um, uh, art skill, right? So there's the ability to draw and paint and you, know, you, you, you can make stuff, but there's really no use behind it just because it's always like for the portfolio or for an illustration. 
But when you get into the professional field, there's a reason you're doing this design. There's a point to this image. This image is, serves as a guide to someone or something. And learning those skills really makes you dial in like what these pieces are for and how to push them further. Like I've had, I've done paintings where I did, I did a super loose, fun gestural painting. And then my creative director is like, dude, what is this, man? This is for a modeler. They can't read this, you know, cause it's loose and gestural. And that's where you start learning these tricks and the professional, like at least my first probably year, year and six months was where the biggest jumps happened. Like maybe two thirds of what I know now is probably happened there versus the ability to draw and paint the first third. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess just to kind of follow up on that quick before I leave to you, Alex, um, when you say like it's about two thirds of your current knowledge base coming through that, do you feel like they were things like seeds that had kind of maybe been planted before and you just didn't have any context for them before, or was it just new information? Like it was just new skills and tasks that you had to learn for working on real projects with real outcomes, as you were saying. Mostly a little bit of, or a little bit of both, but mostly the seeds one where it's like, you know, you, you're taught these things, by a professional artist, right? The things that I teach in my class are things that I, you know, that I do, but the student doesn't have any context as to why we're doing it. So it doesn't always quite make sense. So what happens is you get this moment of like, um, and then, you know, we all, we've all done this where you learn it in class and then you shape it to your own thing after the class is done, right? That's just the learning process. But if you don't understand why the teacher was doing it that way, you might be changing something that's core and fundamental to that process. Um, and whenever I became a professional, when I started working on actual client work and actual production things, it made sense as to why they do things a certain way. And it made me reframe the way I approached my designs because I'm always trying to make the prettiest image right at, at the beginning. But now it, it shifted into, I'm trying to make the best design, which is not always the same thing. Um, and, and understanding what it's for can help kind of target what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to, you know, put on a page essentially, you know? Okay, great. Um, and what about you then, Alex? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I can really pinpoint where the jumps were. I look back and it, it seemed, it felt really fluid. Also, I think it's, it's not, I'm not trying to just brag or anything, but I think in this short amount of time, it's just like every year it's just I'm, I'm at a different stage and I don't know when it happened it's just that um, I have I guess I, <laughs> I I joke but I usually have a yearly burnout <laughs> where I've been I've been um, I've just been hammering away at everything I'm trying to do so hard that I, I just tire out for like a month where I just I don't want to touch a pencil I don't want to open a canvas and kind of there's this mental block of me just not wanting to do it um, but then usually when I come back and I have like the first week of getting back into it, I find that I'm, I'm, I am performing better than I was previously. I don't know if that's just the gestation period of you kind of distilling what you've learned previously, or if you just needed that mental break, but it, I guess those have been some periods where I'm like, oh, wow, some, something changed here. Um, but I would mirror a lot of what Kenny has said, just that my job hasn't had a lot of the, um, I think it, it, it would vary a lot to, for people who are entering the junior field on what kind of job you're in. Mine is on, more on the indie side and they are a little slower with their development process. So I've been kind of on the outside waiting and on beck and call to perform things rather than really having to perform under pressure for a concept art role. So that's, and that extends back into what I was saying that I'm still firmly a student because I, I'm taking on the same kind of learning workload as I was when I was working uh, full-time in tech, you know, I, but I'm, I'm in an art job now. So it's just, it is 16 hours a day of art. It's because I'm trying to maintain the progress because I'm not finding it in the workplace right now. Yeah. I see, I see, yeah. So <clears throat> it's kind of keeping up that pace that you had of working full time and then studying outside of and, you know, trying to keep that momentum 
going. But what what was really interesting about your answer for me is um, this kind of idea of a weaponized burnout. Of a, you know, <laughs> normally like a month of not making art for a lot of people is probably uh, like death knocking on the door. Like that's probably something that keeps them up at night. Like oh, I'm going to work so hard that I'm not going to want to draw or paint anything for a month, and then I'm probably going to just be done at that point like that's probably a sign i can't do it but it's really interesting to hear that um at least now i don't know if it was maybe the first time it happened to you or whatever but you've kind of recognized that you have this cycle where you just need (laughs) to down tools for a a month and that's okay (laughs) to Mm -hmm. to do that and you actually feel a little bit uh better when you come back so yeah i guess it'd be interesting to maybe get some more info from you or maybe Kenny's thoughts on, you know, if you are feeling a bit burnt out, like how do you, how do you use that time, I guess, or how do you kind of take away some of the fear of working yourself to that point? All all the fear is, is definitely there. You know, it's like like when I'm, when I'm in it, it's not because I chose to, and it's Mm -hmm. not, it's not like I, and telling myself, okay, well, this is just that thing again. It's usually after like two weeks that I realize that it's happening. <laughs> and and at that point, I now that we've had it, I can I can reconcile with the fact and just think, okay, um, I'll try to do something. But if I'm not feeling it, then we're we're just not out of it yet. If I haven't <laughs> found the end of the tunnel, but it it it's a different context now too, working professionally that you just. You don't have the choice to take that break. Um, so I, I've found that it's kind of working its way in different ways where like now in my spare time, sometimes I will burn out for a week or whatever. I, I, we might call it burnout or I don't know. It's just like, I don't want to do it. Um, but as soon as the pressure of something that I'm getting paid to do, it's like the something clicks and the, the barrier is gone. But um when when those month long periods had happened i was thinking like am i gonna get back into this why i am I, i'm trying to put it into words but it was not a pleasant feeling absolutely at all i i was searching for solutions trying to find ways to get out of it um I personally found that none of them really worked like you might go to, to a self-help channel on youtube and they tell you all these five hot tips for for how to get out of burnout it's like no i just there is a fundamental block going on for whatever reason i can't pinpoint it uh, so i just need to step away until it's no longer bothering me um looking back on it now i think the biggest block that had happened was because I fundamentally didn't know how to combine the idea of my technical skills with creativity and I the the blank canvas problem where it's like I, I know how to execute, but I don't know how to start and I don't know how to find a final result that I want. Um, so any time that I had that, uh, not paradox, but that issue of two different things, that's when I would kind of stop functioning and break down. So once I either had an idea that excited me enough that I was able to do something is when I pick back up. Or in the past year, I have found more solutions that have kept me creative longer or removed the initial blank barrier. And that's been a huge help. Yeah, you know, I would say it's uh, very, very similar on, on, on on my experiences with, with burnout and stuff like that, where, you know, as a, as a professional, um, it, you can't, you just can't, there's no, there's no way because, uh, they're paying you to, to work. So realistically your lowest common denominator, like your, your worst day has to be passable for this studio, like wherever you're at, if you're, if you're trying to work somewhere and you literally have to have the best day of your career every day, to uh to basically stay afloat you're in a really bad situation just because um if you can't maintain that quality on your worst day um you know you you really put yourself in a situation where you're just almost guaranteed to fail right um so 
that's really where I guess uh, fundamentals and uh, process really come into play where no matter how tired I am, no matter what's going on, no matter what's, you know, whatever life has to throw at me, my process and my fundamentals are going to hold together whatever I'm doing. Maybe it's not the best idea I've ever had, but the idea does work well enough to uh, kind of get me to where I need to go. Right. And that's how I kind of like stave off, I guess, uh, career ending burnouts because, you know, you burn out. I mean, you know, they're like, so when are you going to get better, man? Like we're, we're paying you this amount of money every day to do this. Um, but for, for myself as an individual, as an, as an artist, um, that, you know, just paints and stuff like that really for me is I try to switch it up. Right. So there's days where I learned something where like, there's something I did, something at work. And then my next 10 demos, my next three paintings, whatever it is, you'll start seeing that same thing over and over again in the paintings because I, something clicked in my head and I'm, I was excited about it. But then there's days where I start kind of like, I don't know, things just aren't clicking that well. And the, the paintings quality wise are fine, but they're not where I want it to be. And that's where I switch gears. Right. I'll like instead of like drawing and painting, I'll just watch a movie. Right. I'll enjoy a game, uh, do something that involves the artistic eye, involves artistic understanding, but doesn't necessarily mean I'm drawing and painting. Right. Because I think a big misconception that a lot of a lot of people have like is to get better at art, you need to constantly be moving your hand. Right. Drawing and painting. But that's really not the case. It's you know, your understanding, your eye, your, your brain, your thinking process is really what drives all of it. That's why when you see uh, some artists that, um, you know, do, do like a left hand challenge or whatever, yeah, the lines are a little wobblier, right? But the proportions still rock solid. The design mentality is still amazing. It's because it's their brain. It's their thinking, the concept side, right? And that's what I try to kind of focus in on when I'm feeling kind of burnt out. Just do something else that still art adjacent, right? I don't like completely turn off my brain, but something to maybe kickstart a, uh, a spark, you know what I mean? Because yeah, I mean, when you're, when you're feeling burnt out is usually because the thing that you're doing isn't where you want it to be and you don't know how to get there. So you need more inspiration, more influences to kind of get it to that next stage, you know? Yeah, so I guess um, listening to both of you say that and to try and maybe distill it down and feel free to <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like, you know, you just got to be patient uh, with that. You got to kind of be comfortable with having that feeling and recognizing it when it comes around, um, not panicking from it then. And it sounds like mainly it's just you got to be confident enough to, you know, maybe step away or step off a little bit from what you're doing to kind of have enough room in your brain to figure out what where the block is. Like, you know, you, you kind of let your, um, that subconsciously kind of tick over, but you need to free up some space for your brain to actually be able to, to do that. So it's like kind of saying, do something art adjacent, or uh, as Alex is saying, it's like just kind of patiently wait by the pool of ideas for like something that actually excites you to swim back up to like get you going again. Um, and also, I guess adding what Kenny was saying is making sure that you've kind of got a baseline level that you know is safe to fall back on when you're not able to put your pedal to the metal. Because if you're doing pedal to the metal every day, <laughs> that car is probably going to be run out pretty soon. At some well, point. you guys have mentioned about the your expectations. That is, I, I agree. That's a key point in causing burnout. It's it's shutting down when you're dissatisfied with what you're doing. It, it's your your performance is not meeting meeting what you are expecting of yourself. And I've seen this happen multiple times with a sing, a singular person where they uh, had continued to dive into things that were far above what they were capable of. And this resulted in extreme frustration and negativity and eventually just shutting down after they were fighting through persistent effort that was grueling for them. And they were double guessing themselves, thinking that they weren't cut out for this and was helping guide them through it. And eventually it just came down to the fact that like, it, you just took on too much. It was just, that was above 
what you were ready for and that the, the, what is going to help you is down here that you're more ready to tackle men, even mentally, not even just skill wise. And so it's kind of like you, you can view art as a, as a sport or, you know, like weight training that if you, if you try to go in and you either try to perform a, a game and expect to win, or you try to lift 300 pounds, it is not going to work. You're going to break yourself. So you, you show up every day and you start up on the small stuff, you break into those skills, you grease things up. And then once you get to the difficult thing, it's not even difficult. It's just another day. You're just doing more all at once. And so burnout is that failure to meet all of those combining pressures and shutting down in the face of it. Yeah. And I think a, a big component of this as well is time, right? So like, I think when we're students, usually like you're maybe a year, two years, three years into your process. So a month of time is pretty big, right? Just because like I'm doing work for a month, I need to pay my bills. I need to get a job. There's, there's all these pressures on you to try to get you to, to not be a student anymore, right? But as time goes on, you start realizing that like, it's not really that big a deal just because, you know, you're just because you're out of commission for let's say a month, right? Which is a pretty long time for, for a burnout to be completely honest, mm -hmm. um, like a full 30 days, right? Yeah. Um, it's not really that big just because like when, when, when the pressures are off, when you, you do have a job, when you are working or whatever, and you can still maintain that, that bottom, like lowest level of performance, you know, that's still acceptable. Um, it's really not that big a deal. And you kind of start, I guess, putting less weight on that moment. And you're just like, ah, I'm just a little tired. Or, you know, it's not really that big a deal. And I think we're usually just in such a big hurry when we're students. You want to be performing at peak the whole time, but just know that you're not going to and just accept it and do what you can outside of um, outside of drawing and painting to, to keep growing because that's the that's the, the biggest pressure of I'm not growing as an artist if I'm not drawing and painting. And if you can just change that mentality of like, I don't always need to be drawing and painting to get better, it might help you kind of get through things just a bit quicker and, and give you a broader scope of, of like what's really happening, you know, because it happens to all of us. But depending on how you take it can really be uh, a, a, a detrimental thing to your career or something that it's just a small minor speed bump, you know? Absolutely. And I mean, I guess playing on that uh, concept of time, um, speaking to a lot of students, you know, that is one of their biggest fears, I would say, is whether they're progressing fast enough or I only have X amount of time before I, you know, either I run out of funds or, um, you know, even like how many hours a day should I be doing this? And am I too old? Uh, to do this now like is this the wrong age um, to start it so yeah I guess on the subject of time it'd be kind of just interesting just to get a take you know from either of you if you have any thoughts on like the process of being a student like a what's a what's a lengthy learning process is there a is there such a thing as too slow basically or um you know, is, is age that much of an issue for being a student for either of you? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think so. I think uh, Kenny has told me before that he's always seen the, the issue happen when you put a deadline on things. Cause then it's, that's, that's the recipe for burnout is your, your performance is not meeting your expectation. And so you, you create frustrations for yourself when you're not meeting those deadlines when I first started learning and picking it up and I made the curriculum and all that, my initial timeline was 10 years. Um, I, I put 10 years ahead of for myself where I thought, okay, art is hard. The only time I've ever heard people talk about art is when people are starving for it and that it's an extremely elite job and no one can get one. It's like, it's gonna take some time. I, I, I had a floor with my job and I, I established a pace for myself and I made a deal with my fiance at the time that um, if I didn't have anything in 10 years, then I would stop. <laughs> it's like, okay, that was enough. If, if, if it didn't happen in 10 years, then okay, maybe it'll just be a hobby at that point. But 
since there was no pressure, since there was no expectation of when it was going to happen, I started clearing my milestones in a fraction of the time. And that that was more encouraging to, to see all of this stuff where I had set expectations way off, like not even conceivable that it's like, eh, <laughs> like, you know, if you were thinking from the time from me being born to the age of 10, if I didn't get a job in that amount of time, uh, then it's, it just changes how you look at things. It's so far away. And so it's, uh, I think that helped a lot. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Like for, for anybody, like any students that are like, Hey, I, I'm just starting. I just started like drawing a month ago or whatever it is. Cause you know, you get questions like that. You know, I always say, you know, it's a, it's a four year degree, right? You don't get a degree at the end of it, but it is four years. Generally speaking, um, a lot of people do finish faster. Um, you know, a lot of people, and then, then there's a handful of people that take a lot longer, right? Some people can take even eight years. Um, so I always like, is a rough estimate of a number. Just give it four years and see how it goes, right? Just like if you were trying to be a doctor or a lawyer, right? You wouldn't do your first three years of college and be like, oh, I'm not a doctor yet. It's like, yeah, man, because there's things you got to do. You know, it just doesn't work that way. Um, so I always say give it four years uh, as, a, as a general statement. But there are things that you can do to make it quicker. And I'll start with the things that you should not be doing to make it quicker, right? Oftentimes we find ourselves in the situation of like, okay, I have a limited amount of money because you know money's not infinite, not for some of us. And um, you know, you only have a certain amount of time to learn, whether that is a deadline that your parents give you or for yourself uh, or your wife or whatever. And there's a tendency to skip steps, right? Cause it's like, Oh, you know um, I don't need to know perspective right now. I'll just, I'll, I'll go straight into painting. Cause that's what I see the studios want to see. And what that does is it actually extends your timeline. You, you, in, in an attempt to shorten your learning process, you like doubled it, right? <laughs> just because, you know, these fundamentals carry through, right? Just because you don't see someone doing a grid plus line work doesn't mean that painting doesn't have that fundamental thought in it. And especially as the world building two teacher, I see people that skip world building one to get to my class and they have a very bad time at it. It's never a good th process just because um, I don't talk about perspective as much. Uh, I don't talk about some of the more fundamental things because you should have technically already learned it. And now you spent $800 for a class you weren't ready for that, that made, that's going to make you spend another $800 on world building one and then $800 again on my class again, because now you're ready for the class. And it, 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 it cascades, right? So when people put deadlines on themselves, they often start skipping steps as well. And the best thing that you can do to speed up your process is learn the fundamentals. Take the long way around. Learn, every, learn anatomy. If you're going to be an environment artist, learn anatomy. If you're going to be a character artist, learn perspective. Um, you know, learn how to paint things. Learn material rendering. Because those things, those skills are words, right? It's, it's just words. And then when you start becoming a designer, you start forming them into sentences. But imagine trying to form a story while missing words. You know, there's some words that you can get away with that you, you don't really need, right? There's, you know, some, some of the more higher end words that you can form a story without saying, um, you know, super complex words. But there are core fundamental ones that you need to know to form a perfect sentence, right? And that's really all we're doing here. You just need the, 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 the skills that are fundamental to you. Um, and that's where a lot of like uh, my questions that I, I actually ask in class of, hey, where do you want to go? Because up until about world building two in, in an intermediate level class, you're just kind of going. You're just kind of like, oh, I'm just taking classes. I'm going to be a concept artist. But usually there's not some sort of goal there. Because let's say you want to work at Naughty Dog, right? You have to start learning how to use photos. You, set, you have to start learning how to uh, design in their way. You set, need to start kind of figuring out all the skills that they require. That way you can work there. And that'd be the, for me, the fastest way to get to where you're going, right? Understand your destination. Because when you do start skipping some of the more advanced things, it's a little bit easier to kind of get away with that. So if you go to a place that is more painterly, right? Or, or they use a lot more painting textures and stuff like that. Maybe skipping 3D is, isn't such a bad idea. 
But if you wanted to go to somewhere like Treyarch or Naughty Dog or wherever that's really 3D heavy, I mean, you're not going to make it there if you don't know these fundamental skills, you know. So the best thing you can do is, um, you know, learn the fundamentals and know where you're going. If you can do those two things, you'll beat four years easily. You know, it's 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 quite simple to to beat to 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 match that time that that time scale if you're like kind of just kind of walking around and not really knowing where you're going. But if you if you're in a hurry, the best thing you do is just know where you want to hit and just aim there. You know. Yeah, I can confirm as a uh, a casualty of the I'm going to set myself a deadline and try and be as efficient as possible with which courses I'm picking and maybe I'll come back for color theory one day or maybe material rendering will will be the rendering polish at the end uh, and then just finding yourself spending 12 hours longer on a painting for say like an environment piece than you would have normally because you skipped that uh, materials class that you actually need to finish that environment painting um, and vice versa. And it's also funny hearing uh, you mentioned that you had like a 10 year contract <laughs> with your fiance at the time, <laughs> Alex. I, I basically had to make the same promise. I was like, I swear this, uh, this isn't going to go on forever. This is the, the time <laughs> limit where I will uh, turn it into an amateur goal. I swear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it sounds like, you know, essentially taking the time to do those fundamental classes is ultimately going to be a much longer time save uh, in the end rather than, you know, rushing to specifically the job that you want to do. I guess just saying that, just to clarify when you were saying uh, focusing in on like the job you want to do, uh, it didn't sound like you were saying like that means you should go to a matte painting class as soon as you can if you want to do matte paintings <laughs> at Treyarch. It's more... Uh, find as many classes as you can to uh to get you there or as many resources it doesn't even have to be a class but just yeah do as much studying about all the steps that gets to being a matte painter first otherwise you're going to be a, a bad matte painter for a lot longer than you would be a student of all the other things <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting like uh you see this so often in in earlier students where um we always want to skip the foundation classes because you want to get to the juicy like end game classes, but it actually should be the exact opposite. You can skip all the end game classes if you did all the fun fundamentals and you'd probably be fine because the end game classes are like, uh, you know, the, the advanced classes and they're very topic specific. Right. Um, and it's great because you get to learn exactly what that process is from a very specific instructor. That's usually how it, how it works out. Um, and it's cool because if you want to work there or with that person, right? Yeah, it's good to know what they what they know. But if you skipped it, you'd probably be okay. But if you skip one of the fundamental classes, that shit haunts you forever, right? Because <laughs> you know if you skip, let's say, color theory or whatever, your color is going to be bad from the beginning all the way until you take that class, uh, whether you know it or not. And it just haunts you because you're going to constantly be running into those skills. But um, I don't know. There's, there's specific classes like matte painting classes where you could skip that and, you know, you probably wouldn't run into an issue where something that you would have learned there comes later down the line if you're not a matte painter, you know what I'm saying? And it's things like that that, that kind of gets mixed. It, it's a very funny, uh, not funny, but it's a very interesting dynamic that happens when trying to pick your classes, especially when it's up to you rather than a, uh, a, a school telling you what classes to take, you know? I would describe the the upper level classes at Brainstorm at least as tests too. Yeah. They they are a list of deliverables that they are asking for you to produce. You you're not learning as much as you are producing and to go straight to that when you haven't learned how to produce is just that that's just a <laughs> fundamental mistake. Yeah. It's just like that doesn't work. Yeah, so uh, again those like it being a test is made me think of a topic that came up uh, in our last conversation that um, I had as well. Um, and it was basically this idea of, you know, classrooms are secretly just uh, interviews, basically. You know, a lot of the time when you're taking a class, it's basically a really long extended job interview. Um, and I think judging on what you're saying, obviously, if you are going through like a schooling program and you're getting closer towards those advanced classes, the further down that 
uh, or the f higher up that ladder of classes from beginners, intermediate to advanced you go, the more and more it sounds like they are just essentially curated art tests with <laughs> potential future employers and that. So, um, yeah, I don't know if, you know, either of you would have much to add to that or, you know, how you'd go about approaching that. <laughs> that's, that's a thousand percent correct. You know, I, I tell my students this all the time in every class I take. If you don't think you're in a job interview right now, you're going about your class wrong, right? And not even just because of me. Um, you know, I'll I'll be um, you know I'm on the lookout for for students that are pretty good that that can perform really well because anytime anybody asks me, say, like, hey, do you have any students that are pretty good? Recommend them, right? Uh, but it's also the people in class that are that you're interviewing for as well because somebody there is going to get a job eventually. You know, and brainstorm is 20 students, so. With, with a 20 person class, you know, there's 19 other people that are, will potentially get a job. And when they do, they're going to be asked, Hey, do you know anybody that can also do this work? Because, you know, we hired you, but we need three others. Cool. Yeah. I know, I know three other, three other people in my class, they killed the work every week and this and that. And, and that's really what it is. If you, if you show up to class late, if you don't do all the homework, if you, um, you know, kind of argue with some of the crits or just not receptive to the thing. What makes you think that whoever's hiring you is going to think you're any different at work, right? Mm -hmm. And um, a misconception that that we hear a lot is, um, oh, you know, Kenny knows a lot of artists that are pretty good. Why would he hire somebody in his class, right? Mm -hmm. And the issue with that is that everybody that I would recommend in terms of my friend group it's already working. I actually can't hire them just because they've already got jobs. You know what I mean? Um, so the people that I look for are the people literally sitting in class in front of me, you know, just like, Hey, he did, he or she did all of their homework. Uh, they killed it. They're, they're at a good professional level. Next person that asks me that say, Hey, do you have an environment artist? I'll point, I'll point them right to that person uh, because they're the ones that need the job versus my friends, my friends, they can just apply somewhere and they'll make it probably. Right. But the student will have a lot harder time um, finding that initial job. And so I'm more inclined to kind of help them out. So for any potential students out there, for anywhere, not even just me, just, you know, really take that class seriously because it's the easiest way to get a job. You know, um, I think more often than not, I've seen people get jobs through that way than actually just applying somewhere. Yeah. My first job was because of my friend, Jessica Wajaya. Um, in your WB2 class, Kenny, she she had gotten connected for someone else, and then she got into another small thing that, with friends that she knew, and she connected me. And then yep. she's tried to connect me again at GadgetBot, and hopefully that will turn out one day. And then when I've had the opportunity, I've turned right around and I've tried to extend that to other friends that I have met. And it, it really is connections all the way down. I've seen... Um, some other students who, with their instructors at Brainstorm, they connected them to professional work straight out of class. It's It really is like you're, you're paying for the, the opportunity to network um, at these places, I think. That, that's the true value. Yeah. And, you know, it goes back to the topic that we talked about before of participating in class because you're – you know, in my class, you were very active, very, uh, you know, and it, it, I don't know, I don't know what it's like on your side, but you know, you could see that being an awkward interaction, right? Giving someone crit, especially if you're not the teacher in the class can be very awkward. Uh, but you did it right. And somebody noticed, somebody appreciated it. And then they offered you a job because of it. And it wasn't even the teacher that did it. Right. And that's all it's about. Just because if you're willing to help someone, will, someone will help you just because that's just how it is. And uh, worst case scenario, you help somebody, right? It's like that's not even that's not even that bad. So, I have I have uh, ruffled some feathers with my <laughs> with my critique stuff. It I, I've never known that that would be an issue, but I guess for a lot of people, their work is personal. And yeah. like you had mentioned, Adam, about finding groups, I've only ever been in groups and interacted with people where what you produce is just work. It's not personal. It's it's purely for advancement. So every time yeah. we share something, there's not even a, a critique page. It's just like you post something, here's what you can do to improve it. Um, yeah. And so when I was in another, it happened a couple of times in different groups where I just <laughs> hadn't kept that in mind. 
And I was just like, hey, I, I've seen you around and here's some stuff that I think you could do to improve and it would be, it would be really great. And here's a list of steps you can take. And then I got pulled over to the side and reprimanded. Or even uh, I had to talk to Kenny once because it, it did become an issue at my first job with um, Jessica pulled me aside and said like, hey, you can't interact with coworkers in that way. Uh, you can't yeah. just show up and offer additional critique if there's already a supervisor who has provided something and mm. one, you're muddying the waters and two, you're taking away the, the, author the authoritative power of the chain. Like it, it's your job to execute, not to provide more feedback if you're not in that position. So a uh, really valuable lesson to learn there uh, just to keep it separate. <laughs> but, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a dynamic there, right? And there's a, there's a couple different things where when you're a student, um, there's two things, right? Where they're, for, for the person giving the crit, understand that, uh, you know, you can't come on too strong because you don't know how somebody's going to react. Um, some people are more sensitive than others. Uh, some people can take it. Some people can't. And um, for, if you're a student, just do it. Who cares? Because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, they don't take it. They don't take it. Uh, but also, as the person receiving it, understand that you don't have to take this advice, right? If for, if for anybody, if you receive a crit, it is just a suggestion. Uh, uh, this, we're purely talking about students here. Um, so there's, there's two sides to it. There's the, you know, uh, you have, crit, giving crit is an art. You cannot, uh, you cannot come on too strong. You can't say it how it is, you know what I mean? Um, but also, as the person receiving it, it's just what they believe. If you don't believe so, you don't have to do it. Um, so, you know, when, when you're in a student zone, I, I feel like anybody should be critting anybody. When you're at a professional, yes. That is, it gets, a, it gets weird because there is a person that is paid and, and, and supposed to be giving feedback. Um, unless you have a part in like, uh, for example, if, if, if it was my painting that they are either uh, riffing off of or expanding from, I will give them crit because, you know, there are things that I was told. Um, but, you know, you caveat with, oh, but this is just what I was told. If there is anything that uh, they told you, don't worry about what I just said, because you want to give them an out. And uh, it can it can get a little bit weird because, yeah, I mean, they might take the advice and it might be against the direct, uh, I guess, feedback that the art director, whoever gave them. So uh, in a professional setting, yeah, you do really have to be careful of that. But uh, in a student setting, you should let it fly because worst case scenario, they don't take it and it's not that big a deal, you know. Yeah, I suppose when you're a student, you know, your uh, feedback isn't going to cost somebody's billable hours, basically, when they end up having to repaint it for their their art director. Um, and that note about, you know, whether something's personal or not is really interesting. Um, I think, you know, we're mainly talking in the context of entertainment art and concept art and viz dev. So, you know, maybe it's a bit easier to view what we're making as, a, you know, a product or there's a very clear purpose. It's being made for normally someone else's vision or a group of people's visions. So maybe there's that layer of detachment. Um, but yeah, I would also say, as Kenny was saying, you don't have to take critique personally because uh, if you're making personal artwork, then, you know, someone else's opinion isn't really personal to your <laughs> your artwork so you should be able to disregard that if you want to and yeah you know i wouldn't begrudge someone as long as they're not being a yeah a raging horrible person about work it's fine yeah um but yeah i guess on a, a big tangent from that of uh you know basically being a good good employee and a good fellow student we talk about things being uh, like a job interview in a class? I mean, have either of you ever had an experience where you just feel like you've just bombed a hand in, that you just dreaded coming along, uh, you know, you missed missed an important deadline or just felt like you put your foot in your mouth <laughs> in front of your teacher or your worker? And like, how have All you dealt with that? <laughs> All, All the time. time. I would say more often than not, to be completely honest. <clears throat> you know, there's there's a couple of that um, interactions I've had in 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 my, my, I guess, class settings where uh, it was great, right? And, and some of the relationships that I have today and some of the connections that I've made are thankful, you know, because of it, right? Thank God they were great relationships and great interactions. But there are some classes where um, I was probably the worst student they've had in that class or I didn't show up sometimes or I got busy or whatever. And, 
you know, you can't, you can't win them all. But I think for me, um, really being selective about where you do that, right. Just because, um, you can obviously just by, um, you know, just, I guess, physics, you just can't give everyone a hundred percent, right. That's just, just can't happen. Um, so that, that really comes down to, I think, I think Alex was saying it earlier where, you know, really making sure that you, you're kind of balancing how much you're taking on, right. I think we are talking about burnout for that, but it's the same thing with either taking on classes or, or whatever projects that you have going on with friends or whatever, if you're taking on too much, right, you're going to have to drop somebody and that's where it gets awkward because like, who do you drop? Right. Um, and that can really hurt some relationships just because now you're seen as uh, your reputation as someone that is someone that's unreliable, somebody that doesn't show up to class, things that we talk about, you know, participating in class, it starts kind of a applying to you and just re really being smart about that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I've had plenty of bad interactions, um, teachers that, uh, you know, probably think I'm the worst student in the world or, or at least a student that, uh, that is basically just not not notable right but there are classes that i uh, actively try to really not do that in and you know it, it just happens but that's just part of the process you know the main reason i'm asking is um you know we've got a lot of advice or tips from people on you know how to be a, a good student or how to make the most out of it i just didn't want to uh kind of create this robotic uniform perfect student sausage that gets squeezed out of every school where it's like you've got to turn up 100 percent at every class and you're not allowed to get ill and your dog can't die and you can't accidentally take one too many classes that kind of thing um yeah, yeah just how you kind of pivot <laughs> when that mistake happens when you're studying yeah, it's, you know, it's tough. It's, um, and that's the mistakes, right? That's the, uh, you know, you just, but you got to learn from it, right? If you keep doing it, because I've had, I've had students that, um, you know, th that took my class and they're like, oh, sorry, I got really busy. I took on three classes. I really shouldn't have. Um, and I'm like, hey, no worries, right? I, I, I don't really care that much. Um, I totally understand, right? I should, just like I just said, I did that all the time. But, right, I stopped doing it. I stopped making that mistake every single time that I made it. And that's where it's important because I've had some students that took my, took my class again and they made the same mistake. And it's like, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta change it. You gotta make sure that whatever you're doing, right. Um, try not to keep making that mistake because if you made it once, not a big deal, anybody can forgive that. But if you keep making it, that's where it's like, no, that's just kind of who you are. And you want to make sure that that, that doesn't become the, uh, the, your reputation rather than, uh, you know, just, you just took too many classes or family emergencies or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. That's certainly a delicate balance. I, I'm having to wrestle with that right now where I've just accidentally stumbled into uh, way too many commitments. And I, I thankfully at the very tail end of one. And so hopefully I can clear that out. And then I think with one of them, it's just, I, I got the brainstorm scholarship for intro to Blender, and I think I'll just have to be clear that like, it, it wasn't in my plan to receive the class. <laughs> so I, I had plans already. So it's like, I, I will try to participate, but I, I just, you know, it's, it's going to be on the back burner, that sort of thing. It's it's the last thing I want to do because I feel it every time. Every time that I fail to, to be there 100%, it's like, oh, my. God, I, I totally dropped the ball. I can't believe I did that. And the last thing I want to do is for that to become a pattern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I've, I've had some friends. I don't, I, I don't remember his name, but he was teaching visual development one. And I had a friend uh, uh, taking that. And he talked about like, yeah, I mean, when I was taking classes, I, I had one whole class that just didn't click and I just stopped showing up. <laughs> so I, I think there, it's it's always a case by case basis of like what fits with you. I think everyone's going to have that one time or a family emergency, that sort of thing. What 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 makes the difference is when you're there. Are are you there? You know, like did, did you show up? Did you engage? Because uh, I I think people are way more uh, prone to provide some leniency towards you if you showed up for seven weeks and you were you know actively engaged you were really at the top of every on top of everything and then you 
one maybe burnout bailout or something happens it's like and even then like if you show up in the last week or something it's like i think overall the positive vibes will be that you tried to communicate what happened and you were Mm -hmm. earnest in your intentions it's when you show up and it's like ah i'm i'm never really taking anything too seriously and i overcommit myself to everything that comes along it's like that people can smell that from a mile away and it just it does doesn't fly yeah as a teacher right it really doesn't matter for me what what skill level you're at right because that's why you're taking the class clearly you're probably not as good as you need to be or wherever you're varying levels uh, but it's the effort that I care about, right? So, you know, there's a lot of people that come in my class that don't uh, appreciate the way I teach, right? There's, I mean, it happens just because I'm a, I'm a certain way and they're a certain way. And there's just, a, there's a match that needs to happen for a student to really understand kind of what's happening there. And that's why I say always, hey, take other teachers because you need to find that teacher that is, um, I guess, meshes with you and I'm not going to mesh with everybody. Uh, but... It's, it's the ones that keep showing up, the ones that like, you know, you can tell that maybe our mentalities aren't quite the same, uh, that we don't really quite, um, I guess, mesh in terms of our values when it comes to what we're focusing on in art, but they're trying, you know, they're, they're doing things actively opposite of the way they normally do it. And they're trying and maybe it doesn't work, but oftentimes I've seen around week seven or week eight, something clicks because you know you might not agree with everything I'm saying or you might not uh, enjoy my process uh, uh, um, like most of the way but there is something that you'll like and maybe that is the something that kind of clicks you into where you need to be and um, you know I, I feel like just give it that chance right do it the way that the the teacher or whoever is trying to show you and then once you understand it shift that's when you can be like, okay, I don't like this part and I like doing it this way better. And you can kind of mesh it into your own thing. But it's when, you, if you don't try to do that, you can run into issues of like, you know, you just, it doesn't really seem like you're trying or you're, you know, you're not growing as fast because you didn't give it that opportunity to change yourself. You just tried to do it the way you do it while possibly listening to what they have to say, you know? You will be proud to learn, Kenny, that I... Uh, have now used Photoshop more days than I have used my iPad in the last month. <laughs> nice. <laughs> for, for you, Adam, uh, this has been a year and seven month in trials and tribulations and journey of, of me just trying to figure out. <laughs> my I'm very knowledge. sad. A very sad David isn't here for this call. He is a solid procreate iPad. He's, a, <laughs> he's still been having like, I can't load the file on this iPad, but I'll find a way to do it anyway. <laughs> I don't, I don't need these adjustments. It. Yeah. I mean, he does amazing work on it, but yeah, he is very, it, he would love to hear, I think, someone being like, it's taken me a year and a half to move over. <laughs> It's not been a pretty transition. <laughs> I, I realized uh, six months ago that part of it was the, the copy of Photoshop I was using was bad. It was just Ooh. broken, slow. Uh, yeah. uh, and so moving on to Clip helped that transition. And then I have picked up some tools along the way. <laughs> the gateway <Photoshop>. program. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, there are some tools in Photoshop that are just too useful. So... Uh, working in it and now it's like i'm officially platform agnostic i can yeah. i'll draw and procreate <laughs> then flat everything and clip and then i'll paint in photoshop it it, works it just now. takes a second like every every program that i've used there's always like the other program that i like better or whatever but if it's something that like everyone's using you know it just takes six months right just just grit your teeth just do it and you'll learn you'll learn the tools that you need it only takes really about a week to figure out what tools you need in Photoshop uh, and like how to get to it and stuff, just like Blender and all that. Because you don't use every tool, you only use the small percentage that, you know, is relevant to us. And once you get it, it, it everything clicks. But if, 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 you, if you go back to the old way of doing things, if, if you want to change, if you keep going back, you never really have to figure it out. And uh, especially since it's such an industry standard, it, it, it it makes it easier, not only on yourself, because they're only going to give you Photoshop when you when you go to a studio, uh, but also for the people that are going to be handling your file afterwards. Because 
a big misconception that uh, a lot of people have is that we're the only people that work on our fo- on our files, right? Because we are, you know, it's all, it's my painting. You know, no one else is going to touch it. No, it's never the case because there are either your art director might kind of take it over. Your another senior, a more senior artist might take it over or even a more junior artist might take it over. And then handing it off to like VFX modeling or whatever, they're going to open it and try to figure things out. And if your layering and stuff is all messed up because you're like flattening things and, and moving it over and doing stuff, um, it can it can pose a lot of issues. It's not your job to fix it, but it makes their job like ten times harder. Yeah, so. you don't want to be known as the name of the uh, yeah the three hundred layer document yeah guy who merged a a dog with a cloud on the other side of the yeah. the canvas. <laughs> yeah, we we had uh, we had some files where we were just passing around to each other. I'm not going to name who, but you know we had like a cloud layer and a crowd cloud like sky and then the crowd layer the people merged into one and we're like what the f-? you know what i mean and it's just because it looked fine when it's flat but we needed to edit some stuff because the client always gives you notes or whatever and it's just a nightmare it, it's just something that could have took five minutes maybe even less takes literally an eight hour day eight hour day and uh you know just because it's just so much it's so difficult to handle those files you know <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, just to go on a tangent, if there's sort of a missing step in our education for either of you at the minute, like where you think it might go, or if there's something that, you know, there's two people who've done a fair amount of our education themselves, like, is there an area now you're kind of towards the end of the formal side of it, or, you know, you've done a, a fair amount of it that you feel like is a missing or would be great to add to the roster of things to learn? Hmm. Alex, you want to go first? <clears throat> yeah, it's it, like in terms of just what I want to hit, um, I, I want to make sure that I can get the whole gamut. I just want to be as widely skilled as possible so that I can apply it in other ways. Um, so like I had mentioned earlier, action storyboarding, like if I want to do cool splash illustrations, that's what I really like to do for my own personal stuff. I think there's a lot of value to be gained from just fundamentally knowing how to push a, to pose a camera and move a character in a compelling way so that you can make an awesome painting out of it. So I find like looking at the sort of education you need in that, like what dots can you connect from one point to the other and how to assist this one goal could be really useful. Is Are you also asking like, do we see any holes in it in the current education system yeah just if there's been anything you've been struggling to find or um you know kind of when you get to the end of a class and you're feeling pretty hot on your heels you're like oh i handed in some good work at the end and then i for me personally there's normally a slump after that when you think and now i need to bridge having finished this class to actually making professional work or making something that's going to get me found or um now i'm out of a class uh how do i consolidate this into something else so it's like is there ever a point where you haven't been able to bridge that and maybe there'd be something to teach in between there or you know you've kind of rounded out your fundamentals and you're like where where do i go now or yeah yeah i think the, the biggest step is how to finish things um, that the, when when you're working everything that you need to present eventually has to be finished or when you even if you present something that's rougher looser you have to present it in a way that feels finished for the recipient if, if it doesn't they're going to look at something and say why is that uh why is that all black and it's just like it's just a flatted silhouette you didn't do anything to it like you at, at a bare minimum you just needed to show something but like crossing the bridge from all of these fundamentals to then consistently producing artwork that is going to go up on ArtStation and inspire thousands of people is often harder to find. It's uh, I think that it's the intermediate and advanced sort of stuff is usually much farther between with all the fundamental beginner stuff. You can see this in any field, like in music. Uh, I was producing stuff trying to trying to produce my own songs and i found more value in just forcing myself to finish more songs 
than I was in just trying to find another resource that was going to teach, show me another way about doing something simple. So if there were to be more classes, I don't think there's really a lack of advanced classes. I think it's more just that more students need to take the time on themselves to sit back outside of the class and really come to terms with like, how, how far do I need to push this thing until it looks like the thing that I want it to look like on the internet. Um, it's, and it's kind of a, it's a self, what's the word? It's like, it, it, it's more intrinsically driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rather than it is an extrinsic issue with the system, I suppose. Okay. And just to clarify, uh, one point on that as well, when you say talking about presenting a final piece, um, are you talking about getting it to a level of finish that most people would consider presentable? Or are you talking about the act of actually laying out a page, uh, say in a portfolio, like how do I visually communicate my paintings efficiently to someone that's like, oh, I've made this amazing painting and then it dies because I've put it on a rainbow gradiented background with <laughs> like 3D silhouette text explaining <laughs> where the entry points for the things are. Just uh, just clarifying when you mean finishing a piece, um, like is it more the level of polish or finish or how you're actually presenting yourself once you've made the pieces? Yeah, yeah, it's it's everything. I think until you hit the the upper level classes like kenny had mentioned um it's that's not something that you really touch on so it's it's just connecting the dots it's like how do you pull everything together and finally funnel it down into something that is distilled and presentable on the other end that people are going to look at and say oh that looks professional because i i think there's there's have you have you noticed this like you can look at gesture sketches on like lowish's instagram it's like Oh, that's professional looking. That that looks really sharp. It's like what what are the dots that are being connected there for her that makes it look that way? There's finishing techniques, there's a way that she's using her fundamentals, just certain core things. I don't know. Maybe she's like just detailing the face a little more, uh, rendering that up, but leaving the left the rest gestural. It's like all these little dots or upper level rendering of just matching professional finish using the stuff that you've learned from a beginning or intermediate level. And I would say that that could be a gap in the education, but I think it's also just a bridge everyone has to get, has to, everyone has to bridge that gap. I don't think the class is necessarily, it's the job of the class to, to serve that. Yeah. Interesting. I um I agree, and I I think maybe maybe another way to explain it for me would be um I feel like we're missing everything outside of art, right? Um, because I think there's this idea that uh, to be a professional artist, right, you have to be able to draw, paint, design, right? Those three skills is all you need to um you know find a get a get a stable career. In reality, it's very unstable. Like just having those skills is the bare minimum, and that's sometimes not even enough. Um, I do feel like we're missing um, other classes or at least an emphasis on classes that really teach you how to be a professional artist, right? Negotiating skills, uh, teamwork skills, uh, you know, uh, how to navigate certain situations. And like, because I get questions all the time, <laughs> like, hey, how much should I charge for this? Or how much should I, um, you know, like, who should I email or who, who do I talk to? How do I communicate with this director or whatever? And it's all these questions that it's really hard for one, it's really hard to make a class about that because they're so specific. But two, um, there's so many other skills that an artist needs to have that we really don't cover a lot of uh, because we teach you how to draw and paint, but we don't teach you why we draw and paint, right? Um, there is uh, an inherent uh, gap missing, I would say, when, when, when I see a a student become a professional that, you know, we learn this on the job. Uh, and fortunately enough, you know, I've had people in my career path, you know, the people that have, that have taught me uh, these skills, right? They, they've showed me what these things are and they took time to explain it. But that's not always the case because you'll get, you'll get to a studio where they just expect you to perform and you literally, you have to have 
the ability to figure it out because sometimes your lead just doesn't want to show you that they're not, they're not supposed to show you. They're not, that's not their job title. Um, and especially nowadays during COVID right now that we're not even in office anymore, or I guess, uh, before COVID now that we're post COVID, um, you know, it's, it gets even harder because we don't even know someone struggling, right? You cause all we see is the work kind of being posted. So there's a lot of that stuff that I feel is missing. And that really comes down, c- comes to like, uh, you get a lot of that in like mentorships. You get a lot of that from talking with friends that are actually working. Uh, but there's no like formal way to learn it. And that's where, um, you know, asking a lot of questions, asking, talking about whatever topics that are you're running into that way, other people can hear it too, right? Um, you know, because, you know, I, I ran a live stream uh, this past year and you know in my classes uh the biggest thing is like you know you're going to learn what whatever topic that i'm teaching but it's the questions that you ask that i feel are actually more important uh just because uh you can't find a class on that and you know tying this back into what alex was saying with the finish quality and stuff um i feel like a lot of professionals they know what uh how far to take something just because um there's an intent right? Because what we do as professionals is every image we make has a strong level of intent behind it. There's not a lot of wasted effort because we need to show you the gesture of a drawing like we were talking about. Uh, We'll stop there. We won't start texturing and rendering the skin and stuff because, you know, you lose that idea. And somebody uh, like a high high caliber artists like Loish and, you know, other artists like that, they know when to stop. They know how far to take something because they're um, their experience with dialing in how far to take something is uh, really geared towards production, right? They know how far to take something because there's an intent behind it. And a lot of students don't know what that intent is. Oftentimes the intent is I need to make this as polished as I can, which usually means render texture, whatever, but stopping at that looser thumbnail stage, they might not, they might like go too far or they might not have enough information and it doesn't feel correct. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, it was really interesting hearing uh, from both of you on that, um, kind of connecting it with some of my experiences of um, successful like creatives that I've met, not necessarily concept artists, sometimes, you know, graphic designers or illustrators or, you know, various degree of jobs. But the ones I've met who are often successful normally actually came from a background outside of art and they normally had, you know, a short career somewhere else. And it's not, it doesn't really matter what that career was. Like some of them, it was finance or, you know, computing, engineering, medicine. Um, you got a lot of these fields, but I think it's this period of time that they spend basically in an environment uh which has no creative or very little creative input inside of it. And they're just learning uh, how to be in a workplace essentially, or as you're saying, team working, networking, how do you negotiate wage? How do you deal with a 40 hour week where you have to keep performing even when you're tired? Um, And then, you know, when they pivot to art, they, as you're saying, it it takes a certain amount of time to get those fundamentals down, but that's, a pretty you know it's a pretty given thing that if you study and apply yourself you'll get them and then when it comes to the job period they they know how to be firm about their pay with their first employer they know how to negotiate their working conditions so that they don't get burnt out so quickly because they didn't agree to work 10 more hours than they think they can (laughs) reasonably do and um, things like that. So I was saying it was interesting to hear basically both of you say it's a very difficult thing to put in the class and that's probably why it doesn't exist yet. But I think that pairs up why so many people towards the end uh, start looking for things like mentorships or finding someone who's a few years maybe ahead of them and has started working who they can just talk to. Um, and I guess that links right back to are talking us talking about you know networking and classes you you have access to a creative director who it's no longer awkward for you to say what would you comfortably pay a junior rather than you guessing <laughs> just yeah. praying you haven't shot yourself in the foot <laughs> so um i guess it's almost like a we have like a prepar- uh, preparatory school for artists and there seems to need to be like a 
a finishing school or an apprenticeship or like a big brother program for people <laughs> near the end to just that's a fun idea kind of, yeah. Um, yeah see that's where that's where like um you know i think back then right there was a lot of like there's apprenticeships there was you know you you find somebody to help you grow right to take you to the next stage and i think that's the biggest thing that um you know i think a lot of artists or at least starting artists need to really kind of look for um, because the dreams that we start off with is usually like, oh, I want to work for Disney. I want to work for Riot. I want to work for wherever. Yeah. But those places uh, don't really guarantee you a person that's going to mentor you and teach you and, and help your career kind of grow. Um, realistically, you should be looking for people that kind of do that and, 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 and working with them just because um, if, they, if they do that normally, they're probably like that at work too. And, um, you know, luckily I, I stumbled upon the person or the people that did that for me. And, you know, it's been a working relationship since, but that's not always the case. And if you can find uh, a group of people, a studio that, you know, somebody specifically that, that that's like that, um, it's going to, you know, jumpstart your career. You know, you're, you're going to be, you know, ju like just like just rifling through the initial kind of first years of your career, like within six months, just because they're able to show you these things and get you through them quicker. It's usually not a skill thing. It's a mentality thing. And uh, having a mentor, having a, a more senior artist kind of show you the ropes is really the most important thing you can look for after school. Um, and then, you know, save your, save your dream job for a little bit later down the line, because those places are cool but you're just a cog in the machine there. You're just somebody that um, is providing a service. And, you know, if you get a mentorship out of that, if you get a senior that's willing to help you through that, that's great, but that's not really uh, common, I would say. Yeah, well then just uh, to kind of round things off, um, just basically if either of you wanted to use this opportunity to just shout out a thank you to you know anyone uh, a tutor a parent a friend a dog whatever who's you know helped you get through your your art journey because it's a it's a long old hard one and uh yeah just basically if either of you wanted to say cheers <laughs> to someone who's helped you out along the way yeah. Yeah. dang your partners man just thank them <laughs> it's like it's I, kenny and i have talked about it and joked about like uh, your life before and after art hits because <laughs> it, it's something that kind of happens to you it's like a it's a premonition it's like a, an obsession that takes over if you if you have someone who is willing to uh, to sit aside and and you know either tolerate it or assist you with it and the least you can do is reciprocate back and, and just and try try to give back as much as possible while you are going through an inherently deep and lengthy process. Um, so yeah, definitely thanks to my fiance or my wife, and then Kenny. Same to you, man. It's like uh, meeting you a year and a half ago was a huge deal. I would encourage anyone to, to interact with Kenny. <laughs> Didn't even pay him to say that. My God. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way. Like, uh, you know, for example, like, like you know, my partner, like me, I, I was very different before, um, before even starting art and stuff like that. And I guess, um, you know, the the patience and just the 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 personality building that we've had to go through for the past, I don't know, what is it, twenty fourteen? So eight years at this point, right? And it's just something where there is a there's a level of support and backing that happens that you know no one ever sees uh, except for just me and her and like there's a uh, there's a push that happens and i and i and, so, and the, i've seen other relationships where that doesn't happen and it causes a lot of strain because this career path is a very demanding one um, because it's not really about how much time you put into something it's about if you can do the job or not obviously putting more time into it you'll get better and better at it but that's not a guarantee at the role or even when tough decisions come up uh, all the time, like, you know, dropping out of your schools or, uh, you know, what's what classes to take, what mentors to follow, what what things to put up with or not. Um, you know, these people in your life like really can help either either, you know, pro project you into a better path or 
hold you back and, 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 and drag you down, you know, and not in a negative way, but, you know, just there's things that, uh, that they do mentally for you that can relieve a lot of these things. And, you know, I'm definitely thankful for all that. And definitely the mentors that I had where, you know, for example, like John and James and even some of the, the teachers, uh, the, the, my classmates, you know, there's things that they've taught me outside of art that, um, you know, I've, I haven't heard from anybody else, right? And these things that I kind of just carry with me and the way they held their classes, the teachers that I've had, right? The, that's how, like, the way I hold my classes now is what I experienced from them or what I, what I perceived from them. And, uh, you know, it's just about passing on that information, really pushing, um, you know, the, the understanding of what we, we truly need to be thinking about because um, growing up, I never had a lot of, uh, I guess, friendships where we were like, hey, what are you doing in five years? You know, what are you doing in 10 years? This is a very awkward <laughs> question to ask. And, you know, we'd have these conversations like monthly at some point uh, and just kind of true everybody up and make sure everyone's like on the right path. And, and it doesn't matter what path you're going, but understanding that like it's, it's helping us to, to reframe what that thought process is, because if you don't, um, you know, you could find yourself five, 10 years later doing the exact same thing. And not that that's wrong, but if you have goals in your life, you know, it's definitely going to be slowing you down. And it's that kind of push that I feel is, uh, you know, pivotal and in, in, in pushing me to where I am today. And, uh, you know, I couldn't be more thankful for that. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks to uh, all the people who have their wells of patience for their friend oh, about God. the study of art. Yeah, I, I definitely have a big debt to pay on uh, on that side <laughs> as well. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I have been backed through many things. <laughs> um, you know, especially with like, uh, you, you know, my, my partner, she uh, she does art. So we could be sitting there for eight hours a day doing art and we understand. But for somebody that doesn't do art, that probably looks so psychotic. You're just like, you're like, you know, you're four hours into your assignment or whatever. And she's like, you've been there all day. I'm like, I'm just getting warmed up. You know, I, I can't imagine how hard that might be for, for others. Yeah. We laugh because we all know it's true. <laughs> we it's very entirely. true. It's like 10 hours in and we're like, but I just started. <laughs> okay. Lovely. Well, it was super great to talk to you both. And yeah, just want to say thanks to both of you for uh coming out giving us some time and sharing some some knowledge with everyone yeah thanks for having us but, yeah anytime. yeah happy to um so yeah we'll obviously put links down for uh where we can find you guys' work you know links to any classes and that you have up and um you know if anyone wants to reach out um sure these guys are happy to <laughs> answer questions but yeah just thanks again for having you both for sure. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having us. And yeah, just reach out if anybody needs anything. Okay.